Okay, uh, and we're back with another episode of the Utility Strategy Podcast. And today we have with us a very special guest that we are ex- extremely proud to have on. An individual that has dedicated herself to the important mission of connecting rural America. Uh, in a post-COVID world, uh, it has become evident that it doesn't matter who we are, what we do, and where we're from, we need broadband access. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Shirley Bloomfield, the CEO of NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. How are you doing today? I am great, David, and I'm delighted to be here with you to talk about such a really important topic. Likewise. Uh, like I said, we're really, really excited to have you. So tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, how, how did you find yourself leading such an important mission? Where, where did it start? Ah, you know, for somebody who still struggles with programming my television set, it's amazing I'm in this field. But I actually, my, my background from it really came from the policy side of things. So I, I came to Washington, D.C. decades ago, worked up on Capitol Hill, was a little bit of a jack of all trades working um, primarily on the House Budget Committee where you saw a little bit of everything. And at the time when I was up there, I was recruited by an organization called the National Telephone Associate, Cooperative Association. So that was our genesis of NTCA, what is now the Rural Broadband Association in, in that era was really focused on telephone service and bringing connectivity and communication tools to rural Americans particularly in those areas that had been um, left behind by some of the larger nationwide carriers. So I I moved over here to the association world, did a lot of their work up on Capitol Hill, and uh, really grew to be very passionate about the mission of what it takes to ensure that those folks who live in areas that are outside of urban centers had access to the same communications, tools, technologies, resources, that those in urban centers did. Um, and the evolution just happened, right? We, we went from telephone to telecommunications to broadband. Um, and the thing that I always loved about these companies that we represent here at NTCA is that they are the one-stop shop for their community. You don't usually have a separate video provider or data center or security offering and even in the good old days, wireless providers. So, you know, watching these companies evolve and grow to really think about what does my community need and how can I fill that void has been a very big part of our mission. I I did actually take a slight detour. So um, about 2007 or so, I actually uh, was recruited to head up the Washington office for a company called Quest, which was one of the Bell companies. Um, did all of their federal work, uh, very exciting, then went to Verizon, but had the opportunity when my predecessor, who was the CEO of NTCA, announced his retirement 12 years ago to to come back here and really rejoin the mission that I think is just so near and dear to my heart, um, you know, representing these companies who I think are so amazingly innovative and very community focused. So I've been back here at NTCA for 12 years and uh, we've got some very exciting things on our plate these days. So, so give us uh, give us some uh, uh, some insights into the challenges that uh, broadband in rural America is facing. What's uh, what, what what are you seeing there? What are you dealing with at the moment? What are what are the stakeholders in the industry dealing with? Tell us a bit about that. So, so that is a loaded question. And obviously every country is different. The one thing that is unique about the United States in some ways, um, is how vast it is. It is vast. It is huge. There's a lot of land mass and there's parts of this country where there aren't a lot of people living there. You know, I always get that sense when I'm flying from Washington DC to San Francisco and you look below you in the middle of the country and you're like, wow, I, I see a lot yeah. of nothing out here. Um, but when I, you know, so when we, you, you paint the picture of who my companies are, and we've got about 850 community based providers. We have all of the, the traditional telephone cooperatives who evolved into broadband providers. And the remaining 500 companies are community based, family owned, locally owned um, entities that really arose 
because nobody else was providing service in these areas. It's it's the picture that you get from the 1940s of literally copper wire being strung through barbed wire fences in these farmlands. Wow. So um, in, in continuing to paint the picture, my companies uh, cover 35% of the land mass of the United States, wow. but about five or 6% of the population, which means my companies are in those areas where in Montana, you may have one subscriber per mile of wire. On average, my companies have about seven consumers per mile of facility. The challenge is, the first challenge, there's a lot of challenges, but the first challenge is that infrastructure that you're putting in doesn't get any cheaper when you're in Washington, D.C. versus, you know, uh, you know, Wilson, North Dakota. The difference is you just have a lot fewer people that you are spreading that cost among. So it is thinking about, so the first challenge is the economics. It's the economics of low density and um, long distances and long loops that you are carrying that traffic to and carrying, for example, internet traffic to a peering point to take it on to wherever, you know, wherever that traffic has to go. So that is challenge number one. Challenge number two is um, making it affordable for people because you can build the infrastructure, but particularly when you have low density, if people don't take the service, then it makes it even more expensive for those few folks that you've got on that network. So that value proposition for rural consumers, for rural businesses, for local governments to understand that broadband connectivity is so much more than emails. Um, I think, you know, if there is any silver lining to the pandemic, we certainly saw that with the recognition that broadband has the ability to connect people, regardless of where you live, regardless of, you know, what time of day it might be and how important that was for the economy, how important that was for education, telemedicine, all of those things that, you know, for a couple of years we were craving um, you know, to have access to. So, so broadband yeah. became a little bit more highlighted because I will share, David, that up until the pandemic, I would have put on my list of challenges getting policymakers to understand how important and how much more valuable the network is. The more people you have connected, the more companies you have connected, the more eyeballs you have um, sharing ideas and having sh thoughts and collaboration. So, so those are just some of the challenges. Um, the other picture that if I could paint it for you for a second is people in this country like to talk a lot about the digital divide and that, you know, there's rural America and there's urban America. I think that's pretty simplistic. And I would say that there's really a rural, rural divide. There is a rural America that is served by community-based providers who literally, you know, their neighbors are their customers. Their kids are students in their schools. Their parents are the ones needing health monitoring and, and health care. They, they, their communities live and die by the services they provide. My companies have always been at the top of the curve, the first to offer VDSL, the first to think about triple play because they had to, because nobody else in these communities stepped up. The large nationwide carriers, you know, obviously are very driven as they should be by their shareholder value. To put that money into a rural community with five subscribers per mile isn't necessarily the best sense. investment. Yeah. That's why my guys actually came into being um, so, so when I think of the fact that my companies, and this data is now a couple of years old, 75% of their customer base have access to fiber to the home. That's crazy. I mean, that is, that is so connected. That is not even, you know, having your communities understand how connected and how, how robust that broadband service is. And I know that number wow. certainly has increased over the course of the last two years. So it's also thinking through um, that there is a rural America that has absolutely been left behind and is a real driver behind current US policy to connect everybody. And then those communities that have actually been getting the job done. So just just to, to clarify, 75% of of uh, these communities have access to fiber to the home? Yep, their customer wow. base has access. Yeah, 75%, it's astounding. Incredible, and that's thanks to the work of MP MPCA. 
Well, we we like to think so, but we we you know our job is to put the tools in the hands of our member companies course, to be able to get course. the resources. The member they companies need. are the ones doing the work, but the but the, the advocate is I I'd, I'd say like you're the dominant player. Yeah, we we like to think so, but you know that is what makes it so easy when you are advocating. The story is so profound. Um, and the track record is so solid. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, my guys don't just, you know, talk the talk, they, they walk the talk. Um, and I will tell you that right now they are busy 24 seven putting infrastructure into the ground. They, they, they can't get enough workforce and equipment to do all of the work that they've got ahead of them. Because what I'm finding now is because their own communities are so well connected what they are doing is they are looking at the communities that are outside their service territory. They are looking at some of those other communities that have been left behind and thinking about how they can be part of that digital divide solution, how they can bridge that gap, how they can build into some of those communities um, to provide service to those folks who are still waiting. Yeah. So I saw, um, I think it was an article in the Wall Street Journal, if I'm not mistaken, that you were uh, quoted talking about the importance of uh, mapping broadband coverage. Uh, can, can you maybe go into that a bit? Like, why is this so important? So mapping is like literally the million dollar puzzle piece um, to wow. what we're talking about when we talk about infrastructure deployment. and in part because there is going to be an unprecedented and historic amount of federal funding and, and some state funding that is coming down the pike for broadband. There, there's already been a steady flow and there's gonna be a significant amount once this Infrastructure Act funding, the bead funding really starts coming into play from NTAI down through the states. But the key is if you wanna be a good steward of, of resources, whether it's federal funding, state funding, private funding, you need to know what you're building to, right? You need to know where where the needs are. You need to know what the needs are. Is an area unserved? Is it underserved? What are the speeds? Um, what is the capacity? Is there actually infrastructure? And I think to date, um, we as a country have not put a lot of emphasis on that. That has not been a huge priority. My companies have been longtime participants in the 477 data, which is a gathering of mapping and data done by the FCC because they are recipients of universal service. However, the challenge for mapping in this industry has always been nobody wants to share their data, right? Because if you're a competitor of mine, I'm not so crazy about telling you where I've got infrastructure. But now layer that with, if I don't share where my infrastructure is, I'm not going to be able to get funding or the concern about making sure that we are not using federal funds to overbuild federal funds. How do you become the best stewards if you don't know where the infrastructure is? And if consumers are able to get 25, three, 100 over 20, 100 over 100 gig access. So, so there's a big challenge ahead on that. And the reason it is so important now is the infrastructure um, law and the subsequent rules that we are seeing from NTIA, which is the government agency that is going to be distributing this funding, basically says you've got to do this based on mapping. You know, where are the unserved areas? Top priority. Where are the underserved areas? Um, how are we going to define underserved? Those are going to be the next priorities. But if you don't know what you don't know, what are you building towards? So that is a project that the FCC has underway. It is a so much bigger project than I think people anticipate. Um, but when you are talking about $42 billion for just deployment in one program, um, this is the opportunity to make sure we do it right. How do we make sure that that fund comes down and, and doesn't go to become the third provider in an area when you've got folks in West Texas still waiting for one provider to provide service. So, you know, there's going to be the challenge of um, ensuring a lot of different Very things. Good. I'm really sorry. Very good. Um, there's there's going to be the challenge of, of 
ensuring that we, we, we do this right. And I think the FCC has got a big job ahead of them in terms of um, getting the data, challenge, you know, letting the challenge process work its way through the data, letting potentially another challenge process work through the data. I, I think um, creating this fabric, which we are underway right now, is going to going to be, um, it's going to take longer than anybody's anticipated. And that is going to push back money coming out the door. But I think that's the right, I think that's the right path to take. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes absolute sense. And, and going back to your point, uh, uh, getting the data, I think, you know, when we look at the infrastructure projects, when a company wants to pave a road or put a pipeline into the ground, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but their biggest uh, challenges are the telecom company because mm -hmm. they're very pushy in, uh, number one, giving out uh, data, and number two, um, I'm going to be very delicate here, but they don't always play by the rules of where, where are they putting their infrastructure in the ground and going through the, uh, what our industry loves to call the proper channels of doing that. So there's, on one hand, they're not telling, uh, the telecom companies aren't telling uh, other stakeholders where the assets are. And the, on the other hand, they're putting in more assets into the ground uh, without playing by the rules. So again, you don't have any tracking on even on the new infrastructure coming in. Um, and I, I'm wondering how, uh, how NTIA is going to be dealing with the pushback from, uh, from such big organizations. Yeah. So, you know, I think they've got, it's a carrot and a stick a little bit. So I think the carrot is bead money, right? And I think even some of the large providers are now way more interested in getting into the game than I would have thought. Yeah. I and mean, there's a small part of me saying, well, you kind of had your opportunity to build into <laughs> these markets, but now that yeah. there's federal funding, it's enticing. I get it. Um, and we also, I think, David, have learned a great deal about, you know, that infrastructure is valuable, not just to a community that you may want to serve, but it may be your middle mile. It may be your transport. Mm. It may be your access to a tower for wireless service. Yeah. But you know what? Honestly, if people want federal support, then you've got to play by the rules. You've got to be good stewards. And I, I admire the rigor with which the FCC is trying to instill in this process. I think it's going to be a challenge for the states because, you know, you're going to have these maps come down from the FCC and then 50 states are going to have to figure out, um, you know, is their map accurate? Is the data what they see on the ground? Because honestly, I do think folks on in the state level are closer, right? They have a better sense. They've driven down a highway. They know, you know, that community doesn't have service. You know, how could how could you say that community has service? So yeah. um, I think some of that verification is going to be really important. I will say there's one agency that does a boots on the ground check and I admire them to no end. And that is the Department of Agriculture. And they are now running a very big broadband grant program um, distributed already a couple billion dollars they literally send their field reps into the field and they go, okay, somebody says we've got infrastructure here. Somebody says it is at this speed. Let's test it. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I've we'll heard be of it. What, why, are the, why is the Department of Agriculture involved in uh, telecom infrastructure? I know, right? I, so because um, in the United States during the New Deal, when um, FDR was president, we created all of these federal programs to address needs, creating jobs as well as creating infrastructure. One of the programs created was the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, which about 10 years after they started providing electricity, their mission morphed into providing telephone service. So they are the biggest banker in my industry for wow. rural providers. RUS, which is now the Rural Utility Service, not REA anymore, in the Department of Agriculture, is the wow. largest lender for rural um, utilities in this space. So they are now, 
they they are literally lending for capital deployment of infrastructure and have been for decades since the 1940s. So um, they were actually given a very significant role in a lot of the recent initiatives. And one of the biggest programs that rolled out three years ago, they're in round four already, is the ReConnect program. And that has already put billions of dollars into the ground for broadband through the Department of Agriculture. So they are way ahead of NTIA wow. in terms of actually building broadband. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, actually. And how, like, it sounds like there's uh, uh, some sort of overlap between uh, the Rural Utility Service, RUS, is that, uh, that how, how it's said? And, and I don't know, the, I guess the goals of organizations like the FCC, would that be accurate uh, to say? So, so, okay, this is one, you hit a really important point, and this is why we need these agencies talking to each other, because there needs to be clarity, there needs to be ensuring that you're not competing with one federal program in an area with another federal yeah. program, that would just be, again, a poor use of resources. Yeah. So, um, so just to share the FCC up until the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is a newly released program that did a auction process to put some funding out to unserved areas, which is not going gangbusters, um, is really their first foray into deployment. The FCC's role to date in broadband has really been on the affordability and the the sustainability front. So they have run a program, and we're getting in the weeds, but it's a program called Universal Service, which is essentially a cost recovery program. I'm a high cost provider in Montana. It's gonna cost me $200 per person to put this broadband infrastructure in the ground. My people can't pay $200 a month, but what I'm gonna do is I submit my costs in arrears to the FCC and they will say, okay, to make sure that that consumer has access to comparable and affordable broadband service, we're going to allow you, we're going to, we're going to support you to the tune of $130 per customer mm -hmm. to Got make it. that cost closer to $70. So it's a cost recovery. It, it allows you to know that when you build that network, you, you can recover some of those costs and you can keep the rates affordable for your consumers. Couple that with USDA, which capitalizes. They have a loan program and a loan and grant program to actually take money, fund, and build broadband. Now we're gonna have NTIA, the third agency in the mix. And what they're going to do is create primarily a grant program, but it will be administered by every state. And every state potentially has a different way they will distribute it. So, so you, are spot on. We need all three of these agencies to really be talking to each other. So, so still though, NTIA will be in charge of the map. So of putting that map together, because based on the map, that's how they'll be handing out uh, the funding. But the FCC is doing, so the FCC, who is an independent agency, is tasked with creating the map. Mm -hmm. Then it goes over it. to NTIA. Mm, yeah. Got it. So, that's, so there's uh, a lot of opportunities for challenges here, right? I mean, NTIA exactly. might not like what the FCC did. The state of Montana might not like what their map looks like. I, I think that uh, the biggest challenge that they're going to have is obviously this is a very long process and it needs to be done correctly to protect the uh, the stakeholders involved in the in the system because you still want to uh, maintain uh, the the partners of the the industry basically and maintain their their interest. Uh, but I think the bigger challenge is going to be a, a, a getting that data. I think that's how. Uh, yes. So I, and I agree. And you know the other thing I'm seeing, David, which I think will be fascinating. It'd be interesting, you know, at some point with with your perspective. But you've got the feds working on a map, and some states have also been working on their own maps. Well, which map trumps, right? And, you know, I, I, there, there are so many questions. Yeah. Which states? <laughs> who, are, who are the most progressive states in the, uh, Georgia. In the system? Georgia. 
Georgia. Georgia has been, I think, one of the first out of the box um, to really create their own map. Illinois is um, undergoing a pretty rigorous process. So, you know, what you've got then is the feds working on the federal map coming down through the FCC to NTIA, and now you've got states doing their own mapping. So where right. that reconciles and how that will determine funding, um, how does the who's state in charge of uh, How does the state prioritize such a project and say, okay, this is really important to us, we're going to invest resources in that? Like, what, what's the case that they make? So you know what? It truly depends on the state. You've got some states where they took their ARPA money, which is some of the money that came down as COVID relief, and immediately said, holy cow, we have got to get people connected. We've got to figure this out. We've got to put some grants out there. We've got to start mapping, start thinking about it. We've got to create a broadband office. And then honestly, you've got some states that use the money for highways and some other things um, and did not put broadband in as an initiative. Absolutely state by state, state leadership. So I think it came down to state leadership. Is your governor engaged? Do they see the value? Are they focused on where those pockets are? Some of it's community activism. Do you have people in the state who are going to the state leadership saying, you know what? Hey, wait a minute. You know, we we need broadband out here. Um, So it So there is no uniform process. And then you've got, honestly, states like Minnesota and Wisconsin that have had grant programs for years filling in the pockets of their communities that were unserved. Yeah. Well, um, I want to talk a bit about uh, the SRC program, uh, Smart Rural Community. Uh, can, can you tell us a bit about what it is and um, how uh, how is this uh, founding impacted NTCA's uh, mission? And I apologize. I think I missed the first part of that question, David. Oh, I said uh, <laughs> I said I'd like to talk about the the SRC program, the Smart Rural Community <laughs> that uh, that uh, NTCA is leading. You are you are near and dear to my heart here. So. <laughs> So, so we started the Smart Rural Community Program almost a decade ago because, you know, everybody got so excited about smart cities. Smart cities, isn't it cool? We can, you know, monitor traffic and public safety and do all this cool stuff. And, you know, we really started thinking, you know, rural communities can be smart too. And their economic focus might be a little different. It might be more agribusiness focused or it might be more manufacturing focused. But it is just important as important to ensure that they have access to um, what, what broadband brings and how it can make a community smart. So we started working with our providers to really think about how do you work with your community? How do you make sure you're connecting with your hospital administrators, your school superintendents, your public safety officials and saying, what is it that we need? What is it that takes us and elevates us up to that next level? How do we use broadband to make our community attractive, to entice businesses, to to bring people to come back to um, their hometowns or to come back to rural America? So um, the thing that I love about it, it is truly a collaboration between communities and our broadband providers to say each community is different, but what do we need to do to make our community smart? And then when we're smart, how do we celebrate it? And um, we we have about 250 communities across the country right now that are designated as smart rural communities. It's not necessarily an award for my telephone companies. It is literally them going to their community saying, thanks to our broadband, we've made you smart. Now let's figure out how we create this platform. So, so recently, for example, we had... Um, you know, big hospital groundbreaking in one of our smart rural community areas. And they were drawn to the area because they saw the robust fiber deployment that was going on. Um, And it's that focus on that future proof technology. To be a smart rural community, you have to have a, a very set and significant amount of fiber infrastructure. And your customers have to be taking 
a significant amount of that fiber infrastructure. So we're not talking about a low bar, but I think it's a really important way to share that rural America has this infrastructure, is ready to move. And, and also post pandemic, um, you know, we started seeing people kind of do the whole, I can work from anywhere, right? Why do I have to deal with DC traffic when I can do what I want to do from rural Illinois? Um, and so for our communities to be ready for that influx, which we have seen some of, um, for the ability to identify real estate and businesses that are connected to fiber um, and, and promote that, um, all of this creates a platform. And again, it, it just gets people excited about what you can do with technology. Well, I think there's, again, like there's so much room for, there's a lot of room for opportunity here. I think both for, uh, like you mentioned, technology, but I think also for uh, more providers to become part of this uh, ecosystem that, uh, that you created. Are you seeing a lot of uh, adoption and a lot of uh, uh, organization, organizations joining the program? So we have seen a huge amount of growth in the last year or so. Um, so again, we're up to about 250 Post-COVID companies. I, I, yeah. I, I look at it and think everybody in my membership who's got, you know, that set percentage of fiber should be in this program. The, the other thing that I think why it's going to be so important, David, is that as NTIA puts together this bead program, as communities and states and local leaders and community activists start thinking about how they use some of that money, I think that focus on being a community-based provider and differentiating the rich history, the history of service, the history of being ahead on the technology curve is really important. How do you basically differentiate yourself from a large nationwide provider who has not been servicing those rural communities historically. Um, So I think it's a great platform for my companies to tell their stories, to tell the story of what it is like to build fiber on the Arctic Circle. My guys (laughs) literally have polar bear watchers when they are putting fiber in. They've got these trucks with wheels that are 20 feet high on the tundra, and they're putting fiber optics connectivity up there. Those are the stories that we have to share so that when these resources come out, people say, you know what, I want to work with the companies that have been doing this and they're innovative and they're creative and they're not leaving their communities behind Um, and and thinking through what that looks like and, and how exciting that can be. You know, I've got folks who are creating VA Tell you know, I, I know you have served, you know, we, we think about how do we serve the, the veterans in this country? Most of them come from rural America. Yeah. And how do we ensure they get their health care? So we have been working, um, creating what we call these virtual living rooms. And they are in local libraries, they are in VA halls. And they are fiber connected facilities with a gig service to the state VA office. So these vets are not driving four hours to get diagnostic work That's or psychiatric incredible. care. It's 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 cool stuff, but you gotta tell people. And the other beauty of telling the story is then it catches on, right? People go, I can I can do that. Like I can do that. That's not that hard. I, well, I can I open up part of it. Yeah, it's exciting. It's, you know, and, and, and they're proud of their heritage. So yeah, that is, that is a small snapshot of what we're trying to do with our Smart Rural Community Program. Well, I think, the, the, like, before getting on this episode with you, like, uh, just doing the research, I said, wow, like, there's an organization here that's um, advocating, supporting a part of America that, um uh, Unfortunately, the the big players in the industry have somewhat overlooked, and they're managing to 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 advocate in a way that actually gets the job done. Like so, so many times there are, uh, like you see these associations and nonprofits that like have this amazing mission, but are not able to move the needle. And I think like just just kind of hearing your stories and and the research before the getting on the podcast. It's, like it's nearly unbelievable. 
Well, I I appreciate that greatly. And honestly, you know, we attribute it to our 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 members are on the ground, they are doing the work, and they are telling their story to their policymakers, right? And yeah, and, and if I could just share one of the things I love about the companies we represent is they are just good people, they are solid people. And they don't brag on themselves. So this is one area, David, where I have to be like, no, no, I need you to brag on yourself. I need you to tell <laughs> you need your to members start of doing Congress. Some marketing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're a hundred percent fiber. Yeah. I've got communities that are a hundred percent fiber to the home. I'm like, you wow. need to tell people. You Inner are cities you know, don't always have that. So Washington, DC doesn't have it. So, yeah. you know, um, you know, and and you know what, frankly. It's easier in Washington, D.C. than it is in, you know, um, Williston, North Dakota. Wow. Uh, it's incredible. Um, so normally we end these uh, we end these episodes with uh, with two questions. The first is what in two, two or three sentences, what do you think should be the biggest takeaway for telecom providers, not, not just the, the uh, rural uh, community-led ones, but also the big ones? What do you think they should take away from uh, NTCA's mission? The biggest takeaway is the time is now. The time is now to get the job done if we're really going to be serious about connecting everyone and recognizing the value that that connectivity brings to everyone, it is time to get the job done. Let's get serious. Strong. And second uh, question is, uh, who do you think we should have on next on our podcast? I'm putting you on point. <laughs> wow, that's a really interesting question. So, you know, I would say, um, I, I, I think a lot of folks tend to think about the role that satellite plays. I tend to be very bullish on fiber technology. Um, you know, I think that point counterpoint is always really interesting, you know, in terms of does satellite really think they can get the job done in some of these markets and what does that look like and what are the economics and what are some of the technical challenges? So I would say, um, that might be an interesting discussion. You've probably already done it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Shirley, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show. I know uh, uh, you have an extremely busy schedule, so I really, really appreciate uh, your time to talk to our audience. It was a delight to join you. I appreciated the invite and look forward to continued discussions with you, David. Absolutely. Okay.